Your work is alive to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever. Right, we're going to uh, read from uh, Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 5, and reading from verse 33 which is on page 1033 in the Church Bibles. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say, the old is better. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfields. And his disciples began to pick some ears of corn, rub them in their hands, and eat the grain. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are your disciples doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house, the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and he stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, who is named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon who is called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. And as we do that, let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that even when we fail and mess up and get things wrong, your love keeps on going. And we pray, Father, that we might enjoy that love, we might learn more of that love this morning, and we might live for you in, in that love. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Uh, Kirsty and I uh, lived in uh, Australia for a, a little while, and one of the one of the things that happens when you have a uh, friend in Australia on the social media, you get lots of pictures uh, of uh, beaches and things. And here's here's one uh, of of a beach, more water you can enjoy. Um, actually, this is this is an example. This is actually you know, a harbour beach in Sydney, um, and actually the harbour in Sydney is really really dirty, even though the water looks. Beautiful and lovely. Um, it's salt water, so you'd never drink it, I guess, anyway. But anyway, that's kind of beside the point. Um, but what you don't often see was a picture of a beach like this, um, where loads of people stood on the beach um, and spelt out, Jesus is. It was part of a, um, I guess, an evangelistic uh, campaign. They were trying to get people talking about who they thought Jesus um, is. So people were asking their questions in, in person or online, uh, who they thought Jesus is. And people were saying uh, who they thought Jesus is and why he was um, important to them. And it struck me this week as I've uh, been looking at this passage. Actually, what we've been doing over in Luke over these weeks, and we'll do this morning, is coming to the Bible and looking to see what it says about Jesus, who Jesus is. What's the real Jesus? What is he uh, like? And so we've seen over these weeks, Jesus comes and he preaches good news. Remember we saw at the beginning, in, in, in chapter 4, Jesus said, The Spirit of the, the, the Lord is on me and he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And at the end of that he said, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Now Jesus came with a message of God's favour for people. And then last week we saw, didn't we, all the different kinds of people that Jesus invites to come, who he proclaims the good news to. Those that thought of themselves as unworthy and sinful and you know, they couldn't come into God's presence. The, uh, those who had been excluded from society, who had been considered unclean and wouldn't have been part of the society. Um, the guy who couldn't walk and had to be let through the roof and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven and he heals his legs. And even the, the hated tax collectors. It was the, the undesirables that Jesus welcomes. And we said last week it was as if Jesus was inviting them to a party. We'll see that um, in today's passage as well. At the end of the passage last week we saw uh, Jesus with all the tax collectors and all these others um, at a great banquet enjoying what Jesus has done for them. But we also saw last week that not everyone was happy about it. Do you remember in verse uh, 30 we see uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You see, they turn this situation of great joy, this great banquet, where all these people, all these outcasts, all those kind of people that wouldn't have naturally been welcomed, welcomed by uh, Jesus into something to complain about. They think they're not the kind of people that God would want to mix with. They're not the kind of people that, if you're going to represent God, that you should be wanting to mix with. They think that God wouldn't want to be near these kind of people. And the Pharisees, haven't they got it so, so wrong? They've got God wrong, of what God's like. They've got Jesus wrong, what he came to do on, um, in, in the God's name as God's son. You see, these Pharisees, they were the teachers of the law. They were the people who, they were really serious about their religion. They've been studying and trying to understand. And they get Jesus so wrong, don't they? They get the message so wrong. Maybe um, you could be fair to them and say you can understand maybe why they've got it wrong. Do know they've been steeped in the Old Testament, that Jesus was steeped in as well. But during the Old Testament, we, we see the picture, don't we, that God is utterly holy, pure, right. And that people can't have contact with God because he is so pure. They've been brought up knowing that there was the law which taught them about ways in which they could keep themselves clean so they could come into contact with God. And so they have then formed this uh, picture of God that he is so utterly distant and distant we can't get near him but if we're good enough then maybe God would accept us. 
Of course, they missed the whole point of the Old Testament. Which wasn't about that at all. Yes, God is utterly pure and holy, but God graciously brings people into relationship with him. God loves them and welcomes them. And the law itself was a, was a big, in a way, it's a bit like Lizzie's teaching aid on the floor. It's a big teaching aid to show them that actually they can't keep being pure by themselves. They can't get themselves into God's family. They messed up. They failed. They got sick. They died. They couldn't do it by themselves. They needed help. But the Pharisees missed the point. They think they can do it all by themselves. They can be in God's good books if they keep the rules. But when Jesus comes, it is such a blessed relief. Because he says, welcome. Come in. Be part of the family. You don't need to strive to be pure and right before me. I can make you clean. And we, this morning, we need to keep being reminded of that because we can be like uh, the Pharisees too. We need to keep coming back to see who Jesus is. And this morning we're going to, in these instances, we're going to see uh, three things that Jesus uh, is. And firstly, we're going to see that he is the bridegroom. And it begins in uh, verse uh, 33 with another uh, question or statement from um, the people that are speaking. So see verse 33, they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Can you see there's a, a difference between the Pharisees and John's disciples? The Pharisees and John's disciples, they fast regularly and pray, they, that is, they stop eating and they have periods when they're just not eating. But Jesus' disciples, well, they are different. You see, they are, they go on eating and drinking. They are having fun. They are enjoying themselves. They are, they are at this great banquet. They are eating and they're drinking and having fun. And you can sense the, the, the kind of criticism in the Pharisees saying, why are you doing this? It's not right. But look how Jesus replies in verse 34. Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? You see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, look, wouldn't it be ridiculous to go to a wedding when the bride and the groom are there and there's a wedding banquet and the feast and you're saying, no, no, I'm fasting. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be part of this party. So one of the joys of a wedding, isn't it, that you go and you, you eat and you drink and you celebrate with uh, people do you know whether it's the cake reception after the wedding? I think they're, I think they're quite fairly recent, but they're great, great addition. They have the service, you go across to the hall and then you have a cake reception. Then you get to the wedding and you get canopies. The canopies are great. And they went to one wedding and once, um, um, Adam and Rose will know this, this one. They, they had the best canopies. It was down south. They had like little Yorkshire puddings with a little bit of roast beef and, and a little bit of kind of horseradish on top. It was delicious. And then you have the meal. And then after the meal, you might have had a bit of dancing, and then you'll have a, a, a buffet in the evening. And maybe they'll, I loved it when they had those cheese cakes. They had all those kind of cheese and all the cracker. It's great, isn't it? Anyway, that's maybe, that's kind of beside it. But you don't fast, do you? When you're at a wedding feast like that. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. He's saying the bridegroom is here. Why would you think the disciples would fast? This is a time for celebration, a time for enjoyment, a time for fun. And Jesus is saying he is that uh, bridegroom. That's why he's really saying. Which is really significant because see, Jesus has not just chosen this illustration at random, the bridegroom. Well, in the Old Testament, the bridegroom was God himself. God decide, describes himself as being the bridegroom of his people Israel. That God himself would be the bridegroom who would comfort and come to his people and provide for them and care for them and save them. Listen to these words from Isaiah, a little bit of it up here. Do not be afraid, you will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace, you will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. 
The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. Did you hear that? God himself was going to be their husband. He was going to be the bridegroom. And Jesus is saying, the bridegroom has come. And he's calling people. And it's a time for joy. Well, listen to these words a few chapters later in Isaiah 62. It begins with, No longer will, you, will they call you deserted. Or your name land or, or name your land desolate, but you'll be called Hepzibah, apparently which means delight in her. You'll be called delight in her. And your land Beulah, meaning married. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so your builder will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so God will rejoice over you. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm the bridegroom, I'm here. And so, of course, there's going to be fun. Of course, there's going to be eating and drinking. Of course, there's going to be joy. Let's pick up the language we saw last week. That when the doctor comes and heals the patient, there's going to be joy in that, isn't there? And Jesus comes to call sinners to repentance, and there's going to be joy and delight. That's who Jesus is. He's the bridegroom. In the next passage, we see that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Again, it, it starts in the next section with a, another, another issue, so verses 1 and 2. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfield, and the disciples began to pick some ears of corn, rub them in their hands, and eat the grain. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? You see, once again, the Pharisees, they're concerned about the law. Should the disciples be picking corn, rubbing it between their hands and having a snack as they walk along? They thought they should be doing that. We'll come back to that a little bit more later. You see, the point is, they think Jesus is doing something wrong. And Jesus answers in verse 3, Have you never read? It's interesting, Jesus does this quite a lot. He says, Have you read your Bible? Because that's where the answer is. Look at the Bible. You might look at what Jesus says here, it was a little bit strange. Verse 3 says, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and, taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And you think, why does Jesus raise that? And I think the answer is that because he started to speak about the king. Speaking about David, who was the king of the people. And you see, it seems to be saying David had authority as God's king to be able to go and take the bread, which really wasn't lawful for him to eat. It was only meant to be the priests who ate this particular bread. But David could come in and provide for his people. And so Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. <clears throat> Jesus is saying, I've got authority over the Sabbath. I indeed am the fulfillment of the Sabbath. I can do this. You see, the Pharisees, they're asking a question about the rules to follow, but Jesus is saying, look, there's something much bigger going on. I'm the fulfillment of all those rules. I'm the one who has authority. I'm the Lord. And when we're trusting in him as Lord, there is freedom to live as we were intended to live. Before we think a little bit more about the Pharisees' reaction, look at the next section in which we see that Jesus is the life giver. We've seen Jesus the bridegroom, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, that Jesus is the life giver. Verse 6, again, Jesus is in the synagogue teaching. That's what he it does all the time in these chapters. Isn't he? He's in the synagogue, he's teaching people, teaching them about the kingdom of God, about the year of God's favour. And there in the in synagogue, there was a man whose hand was shriveled. We don't know how that happened. Um, but here's a man with a disability, a man, hand that he couldn't use. And we see in verse 7, rather than feel concerned for the man, the Pharisees are watching, thinking they might be able to trap Jesus. Jesus knows their game. He knows what they're thinking. And so let's pick it up again in verse 9. Jesus says to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? 
to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it. And he looked round at them all. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so and it was completely restored. Now can you see the point that Jesus is trying to make here, that he heals the man's hand. But you see the questions that he asks. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? It's an obvious question, isn't it? It's right to do good. And is it right on the Sabbath to save life or destroy it? Again, the point is, is, is obvious, isn't it? Surely save life. And so what's Jesus doing here? Is he doing good? Or evil, he's doing good, isn't he? Is he saving life or destroying it? He is saving life. See, Jesus is saying, look, I'm the one who's come to give life. Life to those who need it. So can you see the joy that Jesus brings? He's the bridegroom, and so there's great rejoicing when he's here. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, and so there's great freedom to live. He is the one who brings life to those who desperately need it. That's good, right, isn't it? This is, this is the Jesus that we uh, come to follow. This is our Jesus. But you see, the Pharisees don't see it. And the question is, are we the same? Pharisees don't see it. And as I've reflected on this this week, as I've looked at the Pharisees and looked at my own life, it's made me ask the question, do I really see this? I've, I've got a friend who preached on this passage once, and he began his uh, sermon by asking this. He said, if your life, uh, if somebody observed your life, your life was a sermon about Jesus, what would people learn about Jesus from the way you live your life. Now what story would your life tell of your saviour uh, over this week? Would it be a story of joy, freedom, uh, trusting in a life-giving saviour? Would your story, uh, would your, the story of your life reflect that the bridegroom has come? That we have freedom in the Lord? of the Sabbath, that he brings life to us as our King. It's challenging, isn't it, I think, when you ask that question. We were having um, a brunch with some people uh, yesterday, and they um, described how this kind of actually works somehow, actually. So they were saying that their, their daughter had been baptised at a church, um, and they've got other siblings who are not necessarily uh, Christians, um, and they've got kind of partners and things, and they'd come to um, uh, this service, and they'd heard the testimony of the daughter. And one of their um, kind of in the, the kind of their, their children and one of their uh, partners, their partners came after and said, "What's going on here? I don't understand. Her life has been changed completely by this message about Jesus." You seem to have a joy in your life, a happiness, a, 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 a hope. What's, what is it about? I want to learn. Can you teach me? And so she's going to do Christianity Explored and learn what it is that this message is all about. That's how, that's how it should work, isn't it? Our lives are uh, stories of joy, of delight, of hope in Jesus. I wonder whether, in fact, often our lives, I've reflected this on myself as well, whether my life is more like the Pharisees. Because, see, they're not marked out here by joy, freedom, and life. Do you see, they're marked much more by grumbling and fear and withholding. Do you see how it works with the fasting and the, the Sabbath regulations? They take something which God gave as something which was for our good, but they turn it into something to fear. And so in fasting, in the Old Testament, fasting, really there's only one provision where you had to fast, which was the, the Day of Atonement, once a year. There was other fasts, but they were optional. But you see, the Pharisees, they've turned it into something else. They would have fasted probably twice a week on a Monday and a Thursday. 
And they turned this keeping of the law into the basis for the relationship with God. They felt they had to do it, and if they didn't do it, maybe God wouldn't accept us. So let's do it twice a week. And so it was fearful. It wasn't something which caused them to focus more on God. It seems as if it was a joyless duty. It might have made them seem religious. But it wasn't rejoicing in Jesus. Or the same thing with the Sabbath regulations. Keeping the Sabbath became entirely different. No, Sabbath was meant to be the time of rest. To enjoy God. To focus again on God. To uh, recognise our dependence on Him. And see His presence. Yet the Pharisees by this time had turned it into uh, a whole load of rules. So it's almost as if they started with the Sabbath rules in the middle and they said, well, God said don't work on the Sabbath. Okay, so we all want to work on the Sabbath. Well, if we make a whole lot of rule, more rules around the outside of that, then we will definitely will not break the Sabbath. We've got these extra rules. Or maybe if we set some more rules outside of that, then we can break those rules, but we're not going to get into the one to break it in the middle. And so it just becomes this basis of rules and regulations. And they thought by doing that they would be okay with God. And they missed the point completely. The Old Testament law was meant to point to the futility of trying to relate to God on the basis of law. They should have been humble to see they needed a saviour. And to rejoice when the saviour came. But no, they wanted to try keeping the rules all the harder. And policing other people to keep the rules as well. And they become callous and indifferent. And looking on the man with you know, that withered hand, he was just there to see whether they could trap Jesus. They had no concern for him. And ironically, did you see at the end, that they, they go out and they plot with one another to, how to kill Jesus on the Sabbath. It's like the, the, the kind of greatest illustration of how wrong they've gone, isn't it? You see, they should have realised they needed something more. They needed Jesus. And that's the point of the little parable at the end of chapter 5. They needed something new. You can't just kind of try and patch up something. See what Jesus says, verse 36. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they'll have torn the new garment. And the patch from the new one will match the old. And so both things are broken, Jesus is saying. And no one pours new wine into old wineskin, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins and the wine will run out and the new wine will be ruined. The wineskins will be ruined. And the new wine must be poured into new wineskins. See, as Jesus said, you can't just patch the old system. You need something completely new. And Jesus is that one. And he brings joy and freedom and life. But see, the problem with the Pharisees is they would rather hold on to the old. I think that's the point of uh, what Jesus says in verse 39. No one after drinking the old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. I don't think it's a comment about a uh, vintage wine being better than young wine. So it's, not, it's, not, it's not saying that. It's, it's, it's saying rather, they would rather hold on to the old way of life. Then turn to Jesus and find the joy and the delight that he brings. And I think that's something that we can so easily do, isn't it? So maybe you've kind of grown up in a church, you've never really understood the message about Jesus, but you think it's all about the rules you need to keep to be a Christian. And so you come to church week by week and you think, well, maybe I'll be all right with God because I've come to church each week. I kept the rules. I've read my Bible. I must be okay. Or you, you think it was a it's all about the tradition of the church. The traditions can be good, can't they? But if you think, well, I've kept the traditions and so therefore everything is okay, but I must make sure I keep the traditions. Or we can even do it with our Bible reading, can't we? So when I come to our Bible reading in the morning, we think, okay, I'm good. I must read my Bible in the morning, because then, then I'll be okay with God. And so we read the Bible, but we're not really concerned about the things we're reading. We're more just concerned about the act of reading the Bible. We think that's the good thing to do. And it becomes a duty and a chore, rather than a delight to find out about our God and the way he speaks to us. 
Or we come to church because it's a duty to do, and it's hard work, and it's boring, and it's a bit of a, char, a, bit of a chore, and we become depressed by it. Rather than thinking, oh, it's great to be at church, and I get to gather with the other people who God's called in this place. I get to hear God speak through his word to me this morning. I'll get to hear more of his promises so I can trust in him. And when rules begin to dominate how we think about God, then we become like the Pharisees when we don't rejoice. Because you see, Jesus is the bridegroom who came to redeem people, bring people to himself, to provide for them and care for them. We're not thankful that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who brings freedom. We're not delighting in Jesus who brings life. Of course, we can miss it the other way too, I think. We can think it's all about rules. So we must keep the rules. And therefore, we don't rejoice in Jesus. But on the other hand, we can go the other way and think, well, no, Jesus has saved me, so that's great. So I can live life however I want. I can do whatever I want now. It's great. And so in that sense, we, we leave Jesus behind because we're now rejoicing in all the things that we can do. And we can live the hedonistic lifestyle that we want. We've left Jesus behind. And I think this passage is trying to get us to see that Jesus is the centre of it all. Jesus is the one who provides for us. Jesus is the one who brings joy. <coughs> Jesus is the one who provides freedom. Jesus is the one who provides life for us. And who wants to give us that life and that joy. So we need to keep coming back to Jesus, don't we? And encouraging each other to keep coming back to Jesus. And spurring each other on to keep Jesus right at the centre of our faith. Living for him, rejoicing in him, delighting in him, and all that he brings. <coughs> Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you great thanks for Jesus. For all he is. And for all that he means to us. Our Heavenly Father, we do confess that we recognise that easily we can become like the Pharisees and we miss Jesus and think the Christian life is all about uh, duty and performance and rules. And so we become hard and joyless and indifferent to others. Would you protect us from that and help us to rejoice in Jesus, the one who did come for us and trust in him alone. For we be, we pray in Jesus name amen your work is alive to all who hear and obey your word endures forever